even as director of the Center for International Conflict Resolution at Columbia University, Aldo Civico felt the limitations of traditional conflict resolution tools. Then he discovered that NLP and Ericksonian hypnosis provided just the enhanced skills he needed. You'll hear how he has used them, negotiating with leaders of drug cartels in Colombia and doing coaching work with professionals in New York. And today's episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Hey, Aldo. <laughs> nice to see you. How are you? Hey, Doug. <laughs> Good to be connected with you. Yeah. Yeah, nice to see you again. How are things? You're in, where are you, Colombia now? I am actually based right now since uh, COVID uh, in uh, Medellin, Colombia. Yeah. Medellin. Has been, uh, in Medellin, yeah has been the year where I less traveled, less moved out of the house, less of a nomadic, physically nomadic at least, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this year. Yeah. I understand that's a very nice part of the world, that the climate is almost like 72 degrees every day of the year or something. Yeah, it's between the 70s and 80s. It's, uh, it's called the city of uh, eternal spring because the temperature, it's always the same and it's around the spring kind of temperatures and uh, so it rains uh, here and there once in a while for an hour a nice uh, shower but for the rest it's sunny and and nice warm without being too hot i don't know how you can stand it my god (laughs) actually you know i I, as you know i i was born in northern italy in the alps so i'm actually used to uh, a cold winter and snow and um, I haven't had that, especially in, in Christmas times now for a few years, because as you know, I even moved from New York to Miami mm-hmm. uh, three years ago. So, so actually, I have to say this year, I missed uh, the cold, uh, and my win- winter jacket and, and yeah. snow, but it's all good. Well, if it makes it we never, better, it was 14 degrees when I woke up playing, this morning. Right? <laughs> yeah, see? 14 degrees That's, here uh, when I got up this morning. That's Fahrenheit, of course. I'm not sure what that is in, in Celsius. Probably something like minus 10. Yeah, that's, like that's that. pretty pretty cold. Yeah. While, while I get up every morning and I can go and ride for an hour in, uh, in short sleeves. So that's, <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah, difference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I could do that, <laughs> I'd, yeah. I'd probably die. <laughs> uh, well, we have you here today, although not to just talk about the weather, but to um, <laughs> find out, pick your brain, get some insights about some of the amazing things that you do. Um, this is called the, the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, and hopefully we'll get some information about what you do as far as coaching is concerned. But I think one of the things that I really admire about you and love learning and listening to you about is your work with... Um, conflict resolution you've done a lot of work in fact down there in south america with like uh drug cartel stuff right isn't isn't that true yeah yeah that's true that's true that that's what sparked my initial interest in uh, starting traveling here in uh to colombia uh 20 years ago um and you know i came here uh really as a, as a conflict resolution practitioner that was the first uh uh, excuse that I that I had to travel here and uh, and then I I intertwined that with my ethnographic research uh, as an anthrop- as an anthropologist just to understand the stories uh, behind the violence um, and and both things you know the conflict resolution as well as the, my ethnographic research has brought me in touch uh, with the perpetrators uh, mm-hmm. with the uh, people you know adults uh, a lot of young people. Uh, who made that very uh, unlikely choice in their lives to uh, apply violence to uh, uh, and, and you know eliminate and raise life of other people and 
it always sparked the interest of uh, how do you develop that biography? You know, how, how do you get to that point where you can kill, you know, uh, dozens of people and or hundreds of people and disappearing them or kidnapping them and uh, and uh, go, you know, go on with your life in, in that sense. And of course, I, I, I didn't have more a, a psycho psychologist point of view. I wasn't less interested in that uh, aspect i was more interested in, in in the context you know what we we dug in in heaven call landscape somehow mm -hmm. you know that that creates those, those mental maps that make it normal for you make it possible for you to um kill someone and then of course well, how, i'm how really interested in knowing beyond that sorry i'm sorry go ahead say again <clears throat> and and then you know how do you move past that i mean what, what, once you get some insights you know how, how do you heal that how how do right. you transcend that So, right, right. That is, I think, the, the more operative question in some ways. But it, but it's important to understand the first question before you can get past it. I'm guessing. Yeah, it's very important, you know. And and uh, for me, you know, one discovery that I made, uh, the, the way I did it uh, most of the time was by listening to their stories and their life histories. You know, mm -hmm. what were their narratives about, and they justificatory narratives uh, that supported those actions. And, uh, and it was really always interesting for me to understand that in the majority of the cases, the perpetrators had been before and often in childhood or at least in adolescence, victims of violence. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they had you know, the experience, either they were born into an environment that collapsed, you know, uh, because parents were killed or because they witnessed the killing of one of the parents or, or because already in their families, uh, you know, um, many times that's passed from generation to generation, the, the practice of violence. So there was already an environment that made that quote unquote normal. Uh, yeah. There was a, a breakdown of certain dynamics of life uh, of, of what we would call normality and, uh, and that made it, you know, just, just normal. There's a history of violence in the case of Colombia, and I would say also in Latin America, right? This is a country that has experienced more than 100 uh, civil wars since their independence, right? So there's a history of violence. So more, there's more no than generation. 100? Did you say more than Yeah, 100? since, since, uh, since 1810, 1815, since independence, you know, it was never a united country. Wow. Um, Uh, violence has always been a tool for achieving political goals. And, and so there is no living generation in Colombia. Uh, I would say the first one is right now, even though violence is not completely over, uh, but there has not been living generation that didn't experience violence and conflict. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you go back a generation and generations and there is a collective trauma Uh, that is even passed on right from generation to generation. So um, the question is really how you break that. Uh, and, and for me, you know, one of the interesting things, Doug, was uh, I, I, I had a chance to, to talk to people who went through conflict in other parts of the world. And many times it was experiencing a reality of peace before, and then there is violence, and then there is conflict. And then there is, you know, a peace process, right, a reconciliation process, and you go back somehow to experiencing peace, right? Or at least the absence of violence. In the case of Colombia, there is not that before. Yeah, right? the, the before was violence. So uh, there was no, many times uh, peace arises, uh, uh, anxiety, uh, because it's something unknown. It's something hmm. you don't have a reference Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so how do you, you know, how, how do you create that uh, collectively, uh, so so that so that you can create a new experience? You know, that 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 I think it's uh, a particular and unique challenge um, of this country here. This country and lots of countries, it would seem that there's a lots lot of, of countries, um, lot of Reality, conflict. Yeah. And, you know, the, the you're talking before about the the how they justify the story, the story that they use to justify their actions and justify their, their violence. Um, the idea that they were previously victims is I think pretty standard in most people's justification of, yeah. of yeah. being a perpetrator. Yeah. So, well, I'm just getting, I'm just getting back at them for what they did. 
kind of thing, basically, yeah. or what was done to me, not necessarily by this particular person, but you know, by life or society or whatever, by those guys. So it, seems and it becomes an uh, an escapable loop, sort yeah. of, yeah, right, that reinforces yeah. itself and that is transmitted down to from generation to generations, and, uh, in, and yeah, in creating a, something smaller, new, you know, it becomes a challenge. And in a smaller world, I mean, just you know, for the pretty mundane um, challenges that the first world problems that we have from what many of our listeners, I'm sure, um, you know, how do we, how do we find a kind of parallel with that? I think that there is still, in spite of like the, on a mundane side of things from the first world people like us, uh, like me, um, speaking for myself, uh, I've never been victimized perhaps to that level. Yeah, but yeah. there's still probably parts of me that say, "Well, I, I'm justified in doing X, Y, Z because of you know, totally. C." You know, I, I give totally. myself this justification. So, so quitting those patterns again is like, yeah, a big step. It's a big step. Well, I, I think, for example, you know, of families that have been experiencing divorce, yeah. in different kinds of generations, for example, right. you know, or unemployment or chronic uh, poverty, right? Uh, I was working in New York, uh, in New Jersey, specifically with a, a great entrepreneur, Charles Rosen, uh, who uh, you know invested a lot of money to create a regenerative agricultural projects and, and work with uh, former incarcerated people from the Newark area. Mm-hmm. And uh, those were all people that came from generations of chronic uh, poverty, right? That that didn't know and didn't experience much else, right? So, so I would say deeply traumatized people in that, in that sense, yeah. right? Where a certain way of living and practicing and, and even there, you know, crime was just uh, 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 understood at, uh, as the best way uh, to survive, you know? And uh, how many times did I speak to, you know, black kids uh, in, in the Newark area that are part of a, uh, I had, you know, some, some context of conversation with, uh, young men, uh, African American men who were uh, parts of the Bloods, for example, and uh, it was for me always amazing because it resonated with a lot of my conversation here in Colombia. That they didn't think of passing year, twenty-five years, and if they reached thirty, it was already, you know, you were the old G even in terms of ages, mm-hmm. uh, because it was unheard of that you would survive, right? So, for example, no horizon, you know, as a, a, as a as an effect of a collective trauma, no idea of future, you know, of a long-term future. So if you don't have that horizon, for example, you know, we, we, in coaching, we speak a lot about visualization of the future and where do you see yourself in 10, 20. Those people don't have those categories, mm. right? Because that's their experience around them. You, you, if you belong to those realities, uh, you're lucky if you get to 25. So how you maximize, you know, those few years of life that you have. And, uh, and uh, so violence becomes a part of that variable right because you have to maximize the the present moment because you don't know if you have a tomorrow so if i have to kill you because that gives me a one day more one month more of life i'm just gonna do it because that's in any case you know uh, sooner or later that is gonna happen to me so those are the imagery that people have right so uh so those are the things that we need to find a way to transcend and i always say when working with kids we first of all we need to find a way to for them to be possible, imagine that you cannot have a future and live beyond 25 and get to 40 and get to 50. Because otherwise, why studying? You know, why thinking of learning a, 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 a job and, and a skill? Uh, if in any case, I don't know if I'm going to survive next week. Yeah, that's huge. That's absolutely huge. So let's go back to Columbia for a minute. How, how do you um, create a new future for these people who have had no history of peace and that for them, you know, being at a place where there, there is no violence can create anxiety because it's so new and unknown. How, what, how do you do that? You know, there is a very, there is a personal dimension that, that I discovered in my work here. And when two people come together and they come together from two completely opposite different life experiences 
uh, in this case, you know, myself as an ethnographer and let's say a kid who was part of a dead squad or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, those are two worlds that are coming together, right? And I know nothing about their world. Uh, I know nothing about their emotions, their beliefs, uh, their narratives. So I, I learn a lot, right? Because it's for me entering and exploring a completely new unknown map uh, for me. But I discovered the same happens uh, with the other person, right? Because they never met someone like me, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. because I'm a foreigner, right? I'm European, so it's even more exotic. And, uh, and they do realize that I had a different life. I had a different upbringing, that I have a different look at life. And, and that actually sparks curiosity because it's not a speech that I'm giving. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a relationship and, uh, and that becomes an experience, right? And, and that opens, uh, at least uh, it puts some seeds for a different kind of map and say, oh, maybe there's another way of living, right? And, and, uh, and so that happened to me with several of these kids that I have been working on. And, you know, and, and sometimes even guiding or, or helping as a friend or a mentoring as they demobilize and, and you know, moving from a, a life of a combatant that gave them a very clear identity to the uncertainty of a civil life, right? That, that, that's, that's in itself very, very difficult for them to, to transition. And, and it was beautiful to see how, you know, uh, my life and, 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 and I felt many times as sort of representing the, the pinnacle, you know, the, the, tip of an iceberg of something completely different for them, right? Now the question becomes more, how do you sustain that? Because you gave them a sort of a aperitif, right? A taste of what life could be or that there is another way of living. And then, of course, that needs to be uh, consolidated. And that, that needs to be made uh, accessible. And, uh, uh, you know, the ecology needs to change around them. So that's why I think, you know, that... that uh, uh, entrepreneurs and, and uh, like Charles Rosen that I mentioned to you before, but also uh, institutions like states institutions, uh, NGOs and so on have a huge role in making that experience possible and sustainable, right? Uh, so that, that, you know, for me, it's a really a question of leadership. Uh, first of all, you need to have a leader that sustains that vision and is able to sustain that vision beyond the difficulties. You're and about little by little... You're talking about a leader, like a, a national leader or a leader of the... I, I, you know, at, at all levels. You know, it can be a mayor. It can be a, a, someone in a neighborhood. Uh, it, it can be a professional. It can be a teacher, a professor. I think it's more a collective in leadership than just, you know, one, the, uh -huh. the one guy that has all the solutions. I, I think we are a little bit past that uh, in today's environment. Uh, but there needs to be that visionary leadership uh, that sustains the vision and little by little influences uh, an environment and a way of living so that people start changing their beliefs and adopting different kinds of beliefs, right? And, and they have to have experience that that's worth trying, that that's worth, and it has to be convenient for them to change. I, I, I think that's really the, the big challenge. That's a lesson that I got from my mentor in, in, in Italy, you know, in, in the anti-mafia movement. He always told me the culture of legality is not about making people follow the law. It's making the law convenient, following the law convenient, right? For, for, for people. And so that's, you know, that's where I think that this work that sometimes we do one-on-one -on -one with individual needs to be coupled uh, also with some collective kind of uh, work so that we create those environments and those worlds where, where change is possible. Have you, have you gone into like real hot situations like, I don't know, um, hostage situations or things like that? I, you know, m my hot situation were more a peace negotiation. So it was going, uh, uh, you know, uh, meeting with, with uh, negotiation teams of guerrilla groups, or uh, it was going out into the areas where uh, coca fields uh, are and uh, cocaine laboratories are there and, and meet the guys who, uh, you know, manage those, those, those businesses are trying to understand. So those were my hot, hot mm -hmm. situation in that. In that sense, I was part of efforts to to free uh, people who were kidnapped, especially soldiers and politicians. Um, more in terms of you know pressuring the government or finding solutions, uh, but 
not going out to the jungle and try to and, and get someone in, in that sense. Not a, okay. Not a, not a Stallone movie kind of uh, <laughs> scenario. Have you have you felt your life was in danger in different negotiations? Yeah, w- one time in particular, uh, uh, when I when I went to understand really as an ethnographer, uh, what what is this like to live in a village that uh, who's a co- which a commonly who's a commonly is completely relies completely on cocaine, and mm-hmm. so you know I went to visit uh, coca fields and. And and talking to a to a guys who were managing that and and at one point uh, because they saw me with people of a of a competing uh, gang or competing mm-hmm. group uh, unknown to 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 me I became the target of uh, of a of a uh, operation on, on behalf of, of of this competing of this competing group and uh, and that's. You know, probably the most dangerous situation in which I, I would find myself, and where I had to, you know, under incredible stress. Um, in fact, I, I, I give a talk uh, detailing that, that that experience because I, I had, you know, my instinct was absolutely to fly, right, to run away and right. and put myself. Uh, but that that would have been the thing that uh, would have killed me in that moment, right, because. Uh, I would have made myself guilty and, and uh, showing that, you know, I had done something wrong in their eyes. So I had to actually maintain absolute calmness in a, a, and fight my instinct uh, uh, um, in order to, to deal and uh, maintain that clarity and lucidity that you need to understand second by second what, what's the best way to react here so that we all get out you know, safe. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, you know, obviously you have to maintain your own state. And that's true for a coach too. just bring you back to coaching for a moment. We, we need to be able to maintain our states. Yeah. Even we're coaching somebody who might be, uh, you know, having trouble maintaining theirs. And uh, absolutely, certainly like in, in the havening examples, when people are ab- reacting to a memory of a trauma and when we're trying to treat the trauma, you know, we have to, as the, as the coach in that setting, have to maintain our own, you know, groundedness and equilibrium, you know, just, yeah. we've got to be the rock against which they can. Yeah. It's hard to yeah. And, and, you, and, you know, as you mentioned that, I remember one, one session, you know, where one of my clients said something that just triggered in me mm. a resentment mm. and an anger that almost overwhelmed me. And I was, wow, fascinating, you know, and I, I had to put that aside and say, Hey, I'm going to explore that later, you know, but I need yeah. to remain here now. Oh, good. And and it can happen, right? That that a client says something, or, or you are in a particular day, mood, and whatever, and and that triggers you know completely different emotions, and and uh, you have to be able to comportmentalize that, and mm-hmm. you know shift that aside and say, hey, I'm gonna revisit that later on, but now I need to be here completely present for my client. Yeah. So how how do you help people in those situations where there have been, you know serious victimizations you know different gangs you know killing members of the other gang and yeah. you know they're the bad guys or where they're the bad guys they're both bad guys in each other's view um how do you get them past that how do you get them to a place where yeah. they can you know see you know, each other the, the, as, the, <clears throat> as country that was really sure that was really the question that i had when i realized that the traditional tools of conflict resolution came short uh, with respect to the, the work that was needed to be done. You know, when, when I was going to high security prisons and meeting with leaders of guerrilla groups or death squads, I just realized that, you know, the negotiation skills or uh, active listening skills or uh, problem solving skills that are certainly useful uh, and, and you want to have them, but we're not really transformational for what was needed because I, I was meeting with people who had identities rooted in conflict, the identity rooted in violence, right? So, so something else needed to happen. And, and I was frustrated. I was frustrated. And, and, uh, and so I started searching um, something around, you know, change and transformation, personal change. And, and I came up with uh, uh, on YouTube, I, I discovered a documentary about Tony Robbins uh, when he did an intervention oh, on 9-11. 9/11. Yes. Right. And a, a video that is called Indirect Negotiation. 
Yeah. And uh, I have to say, you know, I, I heard, heard something about Tony Robbins. Uh, but to me, I, I never dived into him. I have never seen anything to him. But my, somehow my impression of him very distant was that, hey, very Californian stuff and very, you know, that, that's not, that's not going to work in the real world. That was somehow the prejudice that I had. But when I saw the documentary, I said, wow, I said, if someone does like that on 9-11, you know, that's not show yeah. business, right? That's real stuff dealing with really deep emotions. So the, the, and uh, I was completely blown away. People who are and, listening don't know what happened then. Um, Tony was doing a seminar in, I think, Hawaii or somewhere like that um, on 9-11. A seminar for like a thousand or two thousand or however many people there were, that were there when the planes hit in New York and they were like in the middle of the seminar and this thing happened. And, um, you know, it was literally in the middle of the seminar. They were all assembled. Tony was up on stage and, um, people had some different reactions. Some people obviously were, as many people were mortified and horrified and, you know, traumatized from just hearing about it. But there are a few people in the audience that were like, all right, one for our side, you know, some, some people from the Middle East, yeah. et cetera. And, uh, yeah. and he got a couple of these people up on stage and talked to each other and, and managed to negotiate between these yeah. two very yeah. intensely emotional and diametrically opposed viewpoints. It's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, he did an amazing job. It's like, yeah. <laughs> that was, that was yeah, it's... Right it's, it's uh, yeah, and I and when I saw that, I said, "Well, first of all, your reaction said, I want to do that as well. I, right. mean, I want to be able to do that." But the second question was, "Where is this coming from? You know, where did he learn it? What where?" And and uh, and so I I did a little bit of a genealogy of of Tony Robbins, understanding where this, and so that's how I discovered NLP, and uh, yeah. that's how I discovered uh, Ericksonian hypnosis. And uh, and I dived into it, you know. I started right away. I right probably by the same day that I saw that video, uh, an online course that that some people affiliated to Tony Robbins. I don't remember how it's called, but it's like an online course where there's a lots of interventions with of Tony Robbins, and they break down, you know, what he does and the skills. And, with Chloe and I started watching a lot of NLP. Sorry, the ones with Chloe Madonna's where she. Uh... Yes, co- correct. Claude Melanes and, and her daughter. And yeah. And um, uh, so that's, that's how I started, you know, and, and, and then of course, then, then I started studying, you know, Ericksonian hypnosis and NLP uh, with Steve Gilligan, Rachel, Steve and other people and going to lots of seminars uh, with Tony Robbins doing also his coaching academy. Um, and, and the way I did it was not, of course, with, with, with these people, I was not doing, you know, formal sessions, right? It was more in the conversations in our day-to-day relationships uh, that that uh, I was starting exploring, you know, some sleight of mouth or asking questions in a different way. Uh, what that what that um, would create, and and uh, uh, and then from there I went to more formal conversations, you know, more uh, coaching, if you want, kind of conversations, and uh, and I saw the results. Um, and, you know, people who change their beliefs or people who started seeing a different kind of perspective, or people adopting uh, new states of minds, you know, or being able to access inner resources uh, that were there and that were unexplored. And, and that supported many of the, uh, those kids and, and, and people in, in their change. And what happened, I, I was at Columbia University at the time. I was the director of a Center for International Conflict Resolution. And every time I would go back to New York, I would share that story with several people, you know, and some of them were entrepreneurs or member of family offices. And I remember uh, uh, one person to me, that part of a huge family office saying to me, you know, she said, uh, well, you know, we all have a uh, domestic terrorist on our boards, you know, maybe you can help us to, to negotiate our conflicts. And, and that's then how I, you know, uh, Using it in in a, in a very extreme, if you want, situation or likely situation, how, how I started then using it uh, also in in the corporate world or, or other situation. Wow, would you say that because of your um, investigation and study of NLP and Ericksonian hypnosis, that you do conflict resolution in a very different way than most 
you know? I, I, you know, I, I think I blend uh, skills that, that, that usually people who are traditionally trained in conflict resolution or mediation don't use. Um, and in fact, as you know, because we, we started experimenting that uh, at your center in, uh, in New York, uh, I started, you know, even uh, applying, uh, making it more explicit, you know, and, and saying, okay, what are really the, the presuppositions or the tools that I use in NLP that work in conflict resolution, you know, and I actually remember exactly when, when you invited me to do a presentation one evening, I had to prepare and say, uh, okay, you know, what's the outline? You know, what is it really that you that you do? And 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 that gave uh, life to a, to a framework that, that I still teach and, and and I use in conflict resolution that blends really the two worlds. You know, the, the field of conflict resolution with uh, with uh, with NLP. And I would say, you know, based on my experience, I mean, uh, my own you know anecdotal, if you want, observations. But I can certainly tell you that Ericksonian hypnosis and NLP accelerate conflict transformation um, and, and don't change only persons, but also dynamics in groups or between, between people. Can you, can you give us an example of how that would be? Uh, well, you know, for example, uh, I, I, uh, I use, for example, in LP, the, the whole idea of criteria and values with, uh, with a larger family office uh, where uh, we gathered together for two days, uh, two days and a half with uh, three generations. You know, there was the patriarch who was uh, close to his 90s. And then there was the youngest kids who was 17 and, and the second generation in between. And there was quite difficulty in understanding each other. You know, there was rivalry, there was uh, frustrations and uh, anxieties on behalf of, of the patriarch. And and uh, and they asked me, you know, to can you help us to have more unity in our family you know, to transcend. And instead of looking at the problems and having been talking about the issues that raised uh, concern or, or conflict, uh, we just started looking at what are the values, you know, in their family, what, what are the values that they want to embody and, and, and how, you know, what, what, what would be the norms uh, that they would use and the behaviors, you know, and I used uh, uh, from NLP, I used values, I used criterias, but they also use, for example, the logical levels uh, as presented by Robert Diltz, uh, right? Creating the environment, thinking about behaviors, thinking about skills, but also about your identity and your values and your beliefs and your purpose, right? And it was amazing what, what that sparked because the beautiful things that happened was that what the patriarch saw, uh, you know, it was a very beautiful moment because we did this, almost a sort of a ceremony of the thing where from the youngest generation up, they would present these values and these beliefs to, to the patriarch. And the patriarch was deeply moved by seeing that even the youngest kid shared his, own, his values, and he was not aware of that. Right? Mm. And that relaxed him completely. You, you could just see physiologically, you know, mm. seeing how, how he, almost, almost, you know, Prophet Moses seeing the, <laughs> the promised land and, and say, okay, I can, I can let go, you know. Uh, I don't have to worry because through generations... They embrace what I what I believe in, and and uh, and there was a major change because this patriarch, for example, before he would go to his office every day, you know, and looking, uh, mixed, mixing in in operations and not letting his older son being really the CEO of the company, right? Always there, always mingling, which is not a, a unusual uh, pattern in in this family offices and. Since that retreat, you know, he started not going to the office every day and uh, just just letting go, right? And uh, so it was beautiful because I used those tools and I designed it as a seminar, if you want. Um, we didn't focus specifically on the content of the conflict, but we created an experience that transcended the relationships. And from there, we were able to build something different. Right? That's beautiful. Uh, without NLP or you know, Ericksonian hypnosis and a certain way of using the voice or, or storytelling and all of that. With traditional conflict resolution, I, I don't think I would have had the same, the same result. That's so interesting. That is so interesting. Thank you. God. And, and it's interesting. I was, I've been often talking about this man that is a, kind of a hero to me at the moment, um, named Daryl Davis. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but he is a no, no. He had a TED talk out. He's he's an ma- amazing guy. I'm not. I, I should know more specifically about him, but um, 
he's a he's an African American man from know, Georgia or Alabama somewhere down there, um, but he is a professional musician. I understand, and um, but his the reason his TED Talk exists is because he's he has found a way to talk with and befriend f- now former KKK members. You know, so these mm. you know white supremacist oh. you know extremist sure. KKK members. And in fact, one of them I think was the like the grand master of whatever chapter of KKK that we're in. But he he goes to these rallies. He talks to people. You know, and he goes in and he and he talks and he befriends these people, and eventually, they quit the KKK and they they give them his robes. He's got a collection of like two hundred robes and the hats. You know, the pointy hats um, in his closet. They've they've given it to him as they've retired or quit the KKK, and that's just an amazing thing. It's just an amazing thing to to be in a situation where you know, as a black man down in the South or anywhere, probably um, in America, it's, it's a tough thing to be. Absolutely. <laughs> all the it's it's a very beautiful, um, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's also not completely surprising because that's, that's what we are, the mind of a human being is capable of is huge transformation. And I think what, what is beautiful about applying NLP and Ericksonian hypnosis and these tools happening, you know, to this kind of situation is that sometimes, you know, conflict resolution is perceived, oh, if I have to, I have to compromise, right? I'm going to have to give something up. It's, it's almost, uh, I'm going to lose something, right? And while instead, when you have these transformations, you actually enrich your life, uh, the positive emotions, the quality of your life in, in an exponential way. I'm, you know, I'm sure... And even the half of his uh, former KKK members, uh, just 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 the, the the quality of their life, the quality of their emotion, completely transform, and they have a much more beautiful life now than when it was uh, shaped by by hate or by by fear yeah. or by mistrust, whatever it is that that sparks those phenomena. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree, and I think you know from what I've seen in the TED Talk, et cetera, that that's that's borne out in their, their evidence and their testimony afterwards. It's like, they, they're just much happier people now. And, um, yeah. but you know, where that comes from is the ability to, you know, conflict resolution. How do you, how do you rise above these conflicts of the us versus them, you know, which is by the way, well, you know, our country right now in America is um, pretty polarized. Yeah. You know, so it's it's but a here's very the important thing, question. You know, <laughs> yeah, ahead. yeah, but I I think that here's the thing, right? We talk about the transformation of this KKK man, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but the reality, I think, is that this is possible before because before this black guy, this professional musician, mm-hmm. what, what was his name again? Daryl Davis. Daryl Davis. Yeah, because this Davis reconciled himself before with that historical uh, uh, wound, right? Mm -hmm. He was able to heal that with it because otherwise he wouldn't have been able to, to approach with people with that freedom and with that. So it's, it's a, it's a consequence I would say of, 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 of the work inner work, you know, it would be fascinating to know more about what, what kind of inner work he did because he also comes from generation and generations of, traumatized people right so sure. he was able certainly to transcend that history within himself right and uh, and uh, and who knows uh, what music uh, you know what kind of role music played in that that will be sure. also fascinating to understand but but that's exactly my point right when when you transform yourself when you get to a different level of consciousness when you heal yourself then that becomes a a, a chain a positive chain effect where you inspire other people uh to, to also look at themselves. So okay. I, I see that more an inner work that those men did facilitated by Davis and they changed themselves rather than just conflict resolution in terms of a dynamic. Yeah, the, the dynamic as a result was transformed. But at first, first of all, Davis transformed himself and mm. as a consequence, others were able to transform themselves. Yeah. And you have a new society, basically, a new community. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. And it's also, you know, what you were saying before about the using the, your use of NLP and starting off with a kind of values, et cetera, that they all hold in common. 
So looking for, yeah. you know, not where are we divided, but where are we common? What do we have that's the same? Right. Right. You know, we all, right. and I think that's what Daryl Davis says in his TED talk is that he, was, he, he found those things, you know, where they didn't realize, oh, oh wow, you, you have the same desires mm -hmm. and needs and problems that I have. Well, you're just yeah. like me, you know, finding that yeah, place yeah. where we are the same. And, you know, the values and the uh, priorities and the goals in life that we share in common. To find that first and then start from there. And then, you know, it's much easier to resolve the conflicts that are just yeah. lower level, yeah. honestly. Than that. And that's actually what happens many times in those international conflict resolution processes, right? If you, if you think about the Oslo agreements, uh, they were born out of... Uh, OLP and the Palestinians and Israelis meeting, eating together, living together in a farm somewhere in Norway, right? And and uh, facilitated with conversation facilitated by a sociologist, by by an academic, and those conversations then uh, went higher up and higher up until actually uh, the Oslo agreements were uh, able, and it was like a completely you know clandestine track. Nobody knew anything while the political theater was going on in in, in Madrid, you know. By the way, reaching no, no moving forward, right? Uh, this com small conversation where you were eating together and, you know, uh, where the family of the sociologist was involved and that made it human. You know, it, it was an encounter between humans instead of between roles, responsibilities and, and, and uh, labels and whatever, right? And that makes us rediscover uh, ourselves. Yeah. When that's when that happens, then it you know the transformation is already happening. You know, then yeah, I agree, oh, and I think that, that might be where music has a role to play sometimes. You know, because we're speaking the same language with music. Yeah. You know, for if, if you and totally. I are playing in a band together totally. and you know different backgrounds, different races, yeah. etc., but we're still playing the same song and listening to each other and playing off each other and supporting each other. Um, and sharing yeah. the same emotion, right? Having the yeah. same emotional experience or very yeah, similar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's a joint experience. You know, we're both doing it at the same yeah. time. We're doing it with each other, you know, being yeah. humans with each other and finding yeah. that place where we are the same. That's very, very cool. I, you know, people might have to extrapolate their own, you know, parallels with, with coaching, but, um, but I think it's probably pretty easy for most people to do at this, at this point. And let me ask you specifically, I know that you got into NLP, you know, relatively late, you know, as far as your formal education is concerned, you, you were right. already doing what you do and then discovered NLP and made it even better. Um, as a coach, would you say that, uh, well, let me just ask you, what, what would you say is an essential coaching skill? If somebody wants to be or make them, you know, start off in coaching or become an even better coach from where they are. What would you say are some, yeah. some essential skills for that? I would say, you know, first of all, the, the ability to, to connect. Um, and I'm not just uh, talking about rapport skills in, in terms of connecting the moment like you might have and uh, you do uh, when, when the uh, session begins. But, but I think of, of a deep connection, a human connection, a presence that creates trust, you know, that creates a space uh, where the other person feels comfortable and safe in opening up. Uh, if, if that doesn't happen, you know, uh, I see it very difficult in going anywhere. Um, so I would say I, I would rank probably the, your ability to connect uh, very, very up there in, in the, so can the you skills, give us a, of, of a, skills and value. Can you give us a, a, a hint, a clue as An to example? How, yes, how one can connect? How can we learn to connect like that? You know, I, I, all right, I, I, I tell you, I tell you another example that doesn't translate to a formal coaching session, but, but it gives you an idea. Uh, when I met with, uh, you know, early on in, in my work in conflict resolution with a major guerrilla leader who was in a high security prison, because I was coming from New York, um, he was convinced that I was a CIA officer hmm. and that I had found a way to get to him. So he was absolutely. Um, skeptical and absolutely confrontational and uh, basically used our first meeting 
to teach me a lesson, you know, of why, why it was good to, you know, his cause was a good cause, right? Mm -hmm. So it was not really, uh, it was a disaster from a point of view <laughs> of uh, connection and relationship, uh, beside the fact that we were sitting down. So that was already, if you want, a result. Uh, but, but there was so much mistrust, you know, and a barrier. And, um, but I insisted when I came back to Colombia, I insisted in seeing, in seeing him. So signaling that I was really, really interested in, in knowing and learning more from him. And mm -hmm. when I got there, uh, serendipitously, I proposed to him actually to cook uh, an Italian pasta together. Um, and, uh, and we did. And that broke all the barriers. You know, uh, again, it was then not the anthropologist uh, interviewing the guerrilla leader. It was two human beings in a high security prison uh, discovering with the ingredients that were there, how can you cook a Bolognese pasta, right? And he was so enthusiastic that he invited the prison director and we had a, a small uh, ceremony and feast. Um, so I, I think you, you, have to, you have to do, you have to reach that heart of the other person. You know, and many times I, I do it, now in the Zoom area, you know, where, where, where it might be a little more or apparently more, more uh, uh, difficult, I always have small talks at the beginning, you know. And uh, uh, for example, one of the questions I ask right now is, hey, how is the COVID situation where you are, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I, 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 I try to build that human connection. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and, and, and that warms up the relation and that creates a little bit of a trust. Um, and I think that I have been done doing it now so many times in so many different environments that probably it's one of the best skills that I have is, you know, uh, helping someone opening up right away and, and, uh, and pretty quickly. Um, once that happens, you know, then, then, then you are in a good place to, even the tools that you're using go deeper, right? Okay. Have a, have a, a deeper effect. Um, that's one. The second one, I would say, is curiosity. You know, it's being absolutely really curious, uh, uh, not making an assumption, or and if you have an assumption, just just use it to ask questions uh, to verify it. Um, but just being extremely curious about the life and the situation and the feelings and the beliefs of that of that person. Um, I, I I think having that curiosity. Uh, um, first of all, it's fun <laughs> because you learn a lot. Yeah. Uh, and uh, how many, I'm continually being surprised, you know, by how, by being curious, I avoid the pitfalls of assumptions, right? right? right. Uh, just the other day, you know, I was talking to, because of a heavening practice, I was talking to a woman, uh, I asked her, you know, and so what do you do in life? And her response right away, instead of telling me what she was doing, she was, I'm a widow, which I was interesting uh, uh you know what what she what she responded and and later on she she told me you know i i fall i felt that i i feel a deep void inside me always with me mm. and my assumption was well probably since the husband you know was she felt that that was my assumption right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then i asked her you know uh, and when did you start feeling that void and she went back to childhood you know? <laughs> so if i wasn't say since you know she told me since i was probably eight nine years old so if I hadn't kept my curiosity open, right. right, and I would just make the assumption, oh, yeah, sure, she's a widow, you know, of course she fills the void, we would have missed a great session, you know, in, in, uh, in healing something that was actually really ancient, you know, in, uh, huh. in her. Yeah, that's great, great, great example. Thank you. Yeah, it's very really true. We make assumptions very quickly often, and they're not always right. And it's good to keep the curiosity open and ask good questions with that sort of um, yeah. open, just, I'm, I'm really actually curious. I really want to know how, you know, yeah. how, where's that coming from? That's great. You know, it's interesting. I have a, um, a client person that I've been talking to. It's, I haven't worked with them for a number of years as a client. Um, but we developed a good friendship, but he is, uh, let's, I, without going into any, any details, let's just say, um, he's on the opposite political spectrum from myself. And mm -hmm. um, we had a conversation recently. <clears throat> he, he, he called and we, we spoke for about an hour and a half um, about politics, you know, just saying, well, how is it that you can believe what you believe? You know, how can you right. believe that? Right. Right. Well, where did that come from? And it was just yeah. this really, yeah. really interesting conversation. Um, 
and and we both really strived to have that higher chunk that we are friends we like each other you know we respect each other we have you know good good feelings about that but we, you know keep that paramount and forefront and then just have a genuine curiosity like well how is it that you who i respect and you know think is pretty intelligent can believe that and you know it's a great question to ask if you're asking it yeah. you know like just like oh well, not like how do you believe that but just but with a genuine yeah. curiosity about it yeah. you know when sleight of mouth you know the idea is you know at least from my perspective is that everybody is correct from their perspective you know, they, they see yeah. things from a particular perspective and that's why they feel that way. So if you can, you know, be curious, about how is it that they're in this position and then perhaps lead them to another place around the circle, if you will, you know, to see it from another yeah. side of things, yeah. they get, perhaps can change entirely because they now see it from a different perspective. I certainly think that's what Daryl Davis was doing when he was talking with these guys. He said, you know, the idea was, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't convinced them. nobody ever, um, convinced anybody by, by smashing them in the face. Nobody ever convinced somebody by saying, you're this or you're that. You know, you, you convince somebody by, by listening and by agreeing where you do agree. You know, start small. Start with those little places where we agree yeah. here and, oh, we can agree here and, oh, we can agree here. And then yeah. gradually move it. I think we always find a space where we overlap. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's where you can start building that relationship and actually influence that relationship. I, I think there's a huge difference between persuading someone and influence someone, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. nice. if you influence someone, it, it, it's a change in beliefs that, that comes also from changing your, your perception of life, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and actually is reciprocal. You know, it's not that you just influence the other person. You yeah, sure, are open to be influenced. Right. And that's, that's, that's what, what creates new realities. Right. So I, I you know, I, I really like what you say because uh, last year uh, here in Colombia, I made a very clear decision for myself. There's a similar polarization here, you know, uh, and the polarization is even around the peace agreements. You know, there are people who are supporting f of the peace agreement that was signed with the FARC uh, three, three or four years ago. And there are people who are really against it. Right? And, the, and the, there is little dialogue. And a year ago, I, I, I organized with friends a, a huge uh, retreat with 70 leaders from the country. And you had entrepreneurs and there was former guerrilla leaders and victims and uh, former death squad leader. And, and uh, it was very unique. You know, musicians, never so many people from so different backgrounds came together. Mm. But at the end of the three days, I said, these people are convinced about peace. You know, I, I sort of, they don't need me. And I say, I'm going to look at the people who didn't come, who didn't accept actually the invitation, you know, who are reluctant and don't want a, this kind of peace. And I have developed a wonderful friendship with people who think opposite of mine with these issues, you know, and, and understanding what you say, understanding their point of view and actually starting empathizing. Oh, I, I, can, I can see why you see it like that, yeah, right? And, yeah, yeah. And, and then you find that point where you can start, hey, what, but what is it that we can do together, you know, and, and, and you start influencing each other. They certainly influenced me. And I can see now things that I didn't see before and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, I, I think that that needs that, that that's a daily exercise that we can have. You know, we mm -hmm. don't need to be coaches or experts in LMP to do that. You just, just look for people who think differently and be curious about, you know, curious. your life is going to be enriched by that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so, easy just to go like oh it's them again or it's those guys yeah so so easy to fall into that but you gotta stop yourself yeah, from doing that right you in, in fact people. you know listen to listen to your story with your friend i i i, I was saying yeah curiosity presupposes that you suspend judgment mm -hmm. right because when you judge whether curiosity is gone right i i don't think you can hold both at the same time so you need to spend judgment you need to not to judge the other person but be curious right i really want to understand i really want to know you know i really want to see this from your point of view i don't have to agree right. i don't have to sympathize right but i can do empathize so let me ask you just one other question you know a lot of the people listening to this podcast are coaches or people who want to be coaches yeah um i'm sure there are 
some people who are not and just find it interesting from whatever perspective. And a lot of us are um, basically entrepreneurs. We're trying to, you know, create sure. a living for ourselves outside of just getting a job and working nine to five kind of thing. Um, it isn't always easy. And we might take all the great classes that we take and read books and that we book, you know, but and we might do a great job with our clients. And sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect or a lag time that uh, is hard to get through when you're, you know, hungry and trying to make a living, trying to pay your rent. Yes. I, what what advice would you have for people who who want to be successful mm-hmm. as a coach? Yeah, you know, you know, I, I I tell you my discovery because I went through the same thing, right? And I I don't want to even sum up the money that I spent trying to understand the latest uh, you know marketing trend and and uh, how Facebook ads works and and all of that, right? And um, but at one point, I listened to myself really carefully and just understood, for example, that the model of marketing that is out there doesn't really match my energy and who I am, right? So very aggressive, very alpha. And, you know, hey, if you buy this in the next 10 days or I give this uh, at a half price for 30 people, the scarcity concept and all of that, right? That's just not who I am, um, and I discovered that that in my case, uh, I you know I was looking okay. How did you get your clients? You know because I, I can say that that I'm doing well, right? It's not that uh, I've been struggling. So I say, how did you actually you know? And I I say I never got a client through those methods actually, you mm-hmm. know, because they are not who I am, right? And I, I say I got those, those those clients when people actually invited me to help them. And most of the time they invited me because they recognized me because they maybe saw, they listened to a podcast uh, that either I was a guest or, or I, I did myself or they were part of a conference or they saw me in a workshop and, and they were attracted by that. And they say, hey, can we work together, right? And I recognize that for my, my style is to put myself out there, you know, mm-hmm. giving value, serving and giving a chance of people of having an experience with me. And, and, uh, and, and that then creates clients, right? So my um, suggestion is, yeah, you know, study and read. Uh, there are lots of great books in, in, in marketing that can give you lots of ideas. But, but at the end, you know, choose a method that is coherent with whom you are, right? That you are comfortable uh, and that you don't feel split like, oh, now I'm doing marketing and now mm-hmm. yeah. I'm serving, right? It has to be an integration, you know. Um, you know, I, 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 I've been reading several books and one of the books that I, uh, like, uh, is the, uh, what is it called? The profitable coach or something like that, uh, where, you know, they suggest to, uh, and give someone, uh, even a two hours free conversation where they really experience, you know, your capacity of having a powerful coaching conversation. And, and then when that experience is there, you offer them to continue helping them and, and that turns into a client, right? So, I think you have to sense, you know, try different methods, but my suggestion would be be coherent with whom you are, you know, don't become someone else yeah. uh, when you do marketing, because you're not going to be happy. You're going to be frustrated. Um, you're not going to get client in my opinion. Yeah. Right. Um, so find your organic way in that sense. Right. Right. You know, and then do also Facebook ads. and all That is brilliant advice. And I think that probably is not restricted strictly to marketing either. I think being yourself in, coaching and other things is also great. exactly yeah. yeah so you are always yourself right so yeah. so a lot easier that then it should work you know if <laughs> yeah. you you know, work on that i would say it, it's a matter of development right I, it took me a while to discover who i am actually really in that sense you know what is my authenticity because i realized i was working in a conditioned way you know i was huh. writing my emails and my website and all of that just just not being myself but thinking that that's what works, right? And I, and I think that's a trick. Yeah. That's that's a the trap. Uh, we need to be careful. Well, I will um, finish off this conversation then, Aldo, by asking people or asking you, how will people find you if they do want to get hold of your website or your podcast? Or sure. how do they find Aldo Chivico? You know, the the the, the best way actually to find me is by. Um, if you want to contact me, it is because I have a lot of material in Spanish, but since we are talking to 
people in a, in a English. Uh, I, I think the best way to contact me if you're really interested in continuing the conversation or exploring something more is uh, writing me a, a message on WhatsApp. I'm happy to give my, my phone number, uh, which is 646-492-0372 or my oh. email at aldo at aldocivico.com. That's, that's certainly the best way. And aldocivico.com, if you read Spanish, know Spanish, then you can see my website. Uh, I will have also an English one. That's my 2021 oh, yeah? Good. resolution. Good. Well, hold <laughs> yes, <to> yes. <laughs> yes <Good>. please do. <laughs> aldocivico.com. And uh, Civico is a, Civico is a Italian way of saying um, Civico, really, basically for us. Civic, in Civic. In, yeah, in, in fact, people it's thought it's Civic. not my real life. <laughs> yeah, if people thought that I made that up uh, just to <laughs> reflect what I'm doing in life. It's, no, no, it's uh, it's actually a destiny <laughs> inscribed in my the last name of my family. Civic. Oh, yes, and I'm O'Brien, so it also has that O in it. Very common. So, um, gosh, it's so good to see you. I'm so glad that you're doing well down there in paradise. Of um, <laughs> always. Thank you, Doug. Always a great here. pleasure. Well, that does it for another episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Hope you enjoyed this episode. I certainly enjoyed having you here. Hey, if you want more information about Sleight of Mouth, you can find it at EssentialCoachingSkills.com, or you might even check out SleightofMouth.org. That's a nice website, too. Thanks. Stay safe. Stay curious. <laughs>